Audi is now the child of a crackhead who really loves eating them crack sandwiches. I said, who comes up with this? Hey loves, it's Ava on your screen with another one. Hope you're all well. Today we're discussing Atlanta season five. I wish, season four. I wish there was a season five. Episode five, worth ethic with that exclamation point. They did that on purpose because they're making a point with the person they parodied in today's episode. We're gonna get into it. As per usual, what we do is we talk about the plot, some of my theories and thoughts, and you can share yours down below, so let's go. Episode opens up with Van in the car with Lottie. She says, wake up, we're almost there. I missed the billboard at first, Life Legally Blind. I didn't realize it was indicating where they're going. When they pulled up, I thought, drive through in the daytime? Is that what they do in Atlanta? But then I soon realized that they're getting into a film studio. The way that security guard was going through their bags, whoa, we need him everywhere. He could prevent wars the way he was going through that thoroughly. He even made a comment about, you never know what people put in kids' bags, which is true, because if you've heard, this week someone went into a daycare. States really needs to get it together. Anne parks her car, she seems rushed. There's a tour group over off to the side and someone asks, what's that building? Oh, Kirkwood Chocolate switched over it to his office. I'm thinking a whole soundstage? How much space do you really need? She mentions that he wants it all to himself. No one goes out or in and she laughs. I say, she's enthusiastic for that. I don't know how I'd react knowing I'm working for someone where no one goes out or goes in, but I digress. Let's stay on track. Setting the stage, pun intended. Let us know that Mr. Chocolate is omniscient and ominous. Van walks over to the building to the left, signs up, sits down, and that's when Lottie asks for a snack and she doesn't have any. She rummaged through her bag, says she left in the car. That's when I started to think, if it's in the car, the car wasn't that far back. If your child is hungry, wouldn't you go back to get that? I don't know, I'm not a parent. But I was thinking based on her mental state from episode 10, and I'll explain by the end. Of course, we're in the wonderful, weird world of the Lantern universe. So there's a man yelling for everyone to hear about how he wants to make sure the guy stays there, even if you have to put him in the trunk. Hello, that's not the type of conversation you have in public or on the phone. The type of time he's on, I'm sure they're tapping his ish. Of course, from the corner of his eyes, he catches a glance of Van and he likes what he sees. So as soon as he gets off the phone, he asks, what's her name? <laughs> Van says, Denise. And ladies, I need to know, have you ever given a guy your wrong name or a pseudonym? Is that even how you say it? I only started using my middle name three, four years ago because I realized people will actually Google Alicia then find Life Legally Blind and I'm not trying to have them know everything for safety reasons. But before, I wouldn't care. I'm never gonna see you again. Guys, how do you feel? Are you like this guy? Cause when they call Van up and he's like, they're calling you Denise. Awkward. Van walks through a corridor where there's a lot of billboards and posters that look a lot like a parody of Tyler Perry's work. She gets into a dressing room with a hairstylist named Phaedra. I'm not sure if they knew each other from before or what, but I like the charisma and the connection they have as their key king. You can see Lottie's board. You can also see there's homeboy in the corner spraying down the wig with whatever that is. I don't know much about wigs, naturally curly, but I don't think that's right. All I do know is Phaedra is really bold with it, working at the studio, but saying she doesn't like Casey's work. And Van says, I don't really know that much about it, but you know, I did watch that one movie, this, that, and the third. <laughs> then we see Shamik with himself come in and he sees Van right away, says, oh, he can tell she's new. He's the type of dude that knows when a new one is on the spot because he's always head on swivel, you can tell. Whatever he needs to fix is either fixed or getting fixed. So he ends, exits stage left and Phaedra looks at Van like, okay. <laughs> I like the camaraderie. Then you see the scene of the house. It's very Tyler Perry-esque. There's the bright colored clothes, the really bad hairdos, the stupid ass plot line. I'm crying when the man busts in the scene saying, I told you not to have any friends. I fell out. You hear the intercom come on and Mr. Chocolate says, ruffle up her hair. Now put the hand here. Is this a lesson in micromanaging 101 or what? Is he really playing God or what? What really got me was when the main male character said something disrespectful and Lottie says, shut up. It showed me three things. One, Lottie's innocent. Only someone who's innocent, and I'm assuming she's between the ages of eight and 11. Now, I'm gonna say 11 because I looked that young when I was 11. I always look young but she's probably around that age where she's innocent and she doesn't realize you shouldn't talk out of place. 
Two, it shows you she hasn't endured that trauma because a child who has wouldn't have reacted that way because it'd be normal to them. Three, it also shows that she's not a child star. If she was, she would also be able to be quiet when she's not on scene. But it works in her favor because now she's the main character. It was almost like a walk into the light moment when Mr. Chocolate on the PA told her to come in, then put her in the scene, told them to pick up where they left off, and told Lottie to say what she said again. Before we know it, Lottie's called to be in the next scene, and Van's just like, I didn't ask for this. At first, I'm like, Van, let Lottie live her best life. She was bored and hungry before. The least you can do is let her get one, two scenes off. Things escalated too quick, though. We go to the next studio, which all of them are named after someone famous, so you can Google it. There in the dressing room, there's an older woman. I don't know what her job was. She basically told Vanessa, if Lottie loves it, like it, support her. I thought that was really good advice, but it also was foreshadowing what was to come. <laughs> Lottie said that she wants to film and she looks like Dolja Cat. I said, uh, sit yourself down. You're too young for that. I started to realize why Van had the concern she did, especially when they're back on scene. The two child stars are now on scene by themselves. Meanwhile, Van is next to the child star's mom who says, we got to stick together. At first, I'm like, okay, on a like parental level. But then she started to say something and I said, is this, is she alluding to colorism? Cause she's saying Lottie's type will make it, but her daughter's type, I said, I'm just gonna leave that alone. Cause I don't want to read into this too much. Before you know it, scene's a wrap, it's perfect. Lottie's a natural, she gets called and whisked away to the next scene and Van's like, wait, what's going on? I'm the parent, I didn't consent. How many more scenes? The PA flips through 14, hello, that's a lot for a child. Oh, she'll be done by lunch. Yeah, right. That's why there are laws in place for this. Van is upset. She wants to go to the next studio, but the girl can't because she has three different jobs at once and got to stay put. So of course, Mr. Fix-It-All comes in to help with the situation. He walks her over slowly, might I add, so he can get his own story in about how he was incarcerated. But this gave him a chance and an opportunity to start coding and have a crypto thingy in his house with the solar panels. I said, are you supposed to be siphoning crypto? Is that, does that go with promotion? I don't even know if that's legal. He handed her a card afterwards and I kept thinking, so what's the status with Earn though? She did give him her real name. I noticed that. Now we're in a different stage. For whatever reason, Lottie is now the child of a crackhead who really loves eating them crack sandwiches. I said, who comes up with this? It was creepy because you hear Lottie's voice as soon as Van enters the room saying, Mom, why did you bring me here? Almost as if Lottie was speaking to her at that moment, right? Read it on four levels. She was saying it to Van, why did you bring me here? She was saying it in the general sense of a child actor. Why would you bring me into this circumstance where I could be exposed to these things? She was saying it as the character. Why did you bring me here? You're a crackhead. Why would you put me through this? You're supposed to protect me as a parent. And lastly, in real life, when children come, they don't ask to be here, but they're brought here and parents' jobs are protected at all costs. And whether it's a real life crackhead or a parent that's emotionally unstable, parents cause so much trauma. That's why when people go to therapy, the niche and the crux of it is usually childhood trauma. Van goes over to the bed only to see Lottie houdini again. She's gone. She's frustrated. At one point, I don't know if it's this point or a little bit before, she hops in a caddy with two of the Casey employees who love him. They realize he's problematic. Van's in the back like a lot of people who've had commentary on Tyler Perry's or Oprah's or PDD's or Cardi B's and Megan Thee Stallion's or past rappers and performers and artists and creators who have said that these people exploit or take advantage of or cast light on certain tropes that don't need it. But I love how the two in the front were affirming the good things that he does. He gives back to the community. There's jobs for people that look like us. There's two sides to everything. And this episode really encompassed that. I was with them until they said they would support OJ because no, 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 no. I'm not here for OJ the same way I'm falling off of Ye. All of the shenanigans this week with Ye, mm -mm, he thinks he's above his blackness the same way OJ did and I cannot tolerate that. At this point, Van has had enough. She wants her child back. She asked the intercom. He says, no. <laughs> and that's when she bursts open the door. The older lady that was in the fitting room asked if she was okay. She ignores. She walks over, tries to get in. The two big buff security guards will not let her in, but of course, the older lady to the rescue, she had a gun, shot him up. The other guy put up his hands. This is just a prop from another movie. So stupid. 
she goes into this dark room where there's a tunnel she has to go up a ladder i'm thinking state of the art why don't you have an escalator or an elevator what's going on here i love this scene when she enters in and she sees the control center aka mindset and lair of the teddy perkins tyler perry character you see all the paper and the chaos and the mess and the bottles of alcohol. Donna Glover swivels around the same way D'Angelo did in this episode. This is really giving Teddy Perkins meets D'Angelo energy. Van is calling him out like you're just doing these stereotype things. He's saying, well, you're a chocolate woman. When he read her, I fell out. When he clicked through and had those receipts, you're a single mom who doesn't have money to feed your kid. I said, okay, that's extreme. Oh, you have the light skin incarcerated male interest. Sir, that's your employee. Oh, you have the auntie that's a Bible thumping gump troper. Also, I think that's your employee. And everything else he said, I was like, okay, yes, but no. And that's when I realized this episode is on so many levels. It's not just about making a parody of Barry. It's not just about the commentary and the culture or what it is to be a child star and the horrors and dangers that come with it. It's almost as if it's a parody of Atlanta itself. I realized for the first time, I've been watching a show that has taken black stereotypes to the next level, but kept so much realism in it that I have respect for it. When you think about it, let's break it down. We have Earn, the dusty baby daddy who's not accepting his responsibilities. He eventually elevates, but that's where we start off. We have Al, the wannabe rapper who isn't that good, but actually ends up not being passionate about it and has complexity to himself. We have Darius, which we've never really seen a Darius on the screen before. The closest thing I can think of is Issa from Insecure, that awkward, you can't really put a finger on him kind of character, but we haven't seen an esoteric one. So really that's not quite a comparison. Then we have Van, as he said, the light-skinned, again, playing on the privilege of last week's episode, baby mama who has a dark skin, who she corrects, medium-skinned baby daddy. I didn't realize until now how many different stereotypes Donald Glover and Tyler Perry use respectively to tell a tale. Then that had me thinking, and tell me if I'm going too far off, this whole episode really speaks to how we can't get mad at creators for creating these things because if we click and consume we create the cycle that creates this supply and demand do you know what i mean is it life imitating art or is it art imitating life is it a fact that we watch these shows and movies because we relate and resonate or we find it entertaining and we keep endorsing this behavior if we decided to collectively stop would the support funds from this not be able to support a community in other ways? It brings up this great debate of do we support blackness for blackness sake or do we excel because that's what we're meant to do? Do we excel and only expect excellence? I've been hearing this great debate about the recent BET Hip Hop Awards. It could have been better, but they won't get funding because people don't watch that. It's a conundrum. We need to support our own the same way the Kirkland employee said, oh, because it's not a white award show, when Van said, oh, it's just the NWCP or the BET. It's not just that. It's something created for blackness, although BET is not created by black people. We could talk about that later. It's the concept of us giving value in our own communities and cultures and being the gatekeepers at the same time. There is so many dualities there and they do this intentionally so you can go back and watch it and take something different each and every time. Overall, this episode was everything. It's one of my favorites of all time. I can't wait to see what they do next week. Wrap up, let me just wrap up the plot a little bit. They get home and I love this moment where Van really gets to show her parenting and maturity. I grew up in a household where if I wanted something, I didn't get it. Don't be a sucker, buddy. Want me to give you something to cry for? There was something beautiful about breaking the generational curse, similarly to how Ern and Al did when they walked away from their family drama. You saw that last week. There was something so beautiful about Van seeing Lottie's pain and saying, sorry that I brought you into that, but I know you're not ready for it. But when you are, you can make the decision yourself. Then when she pulls out that card and looks at the back and homeboy said, let's have sex in the boiler room, we know she didn't make a mistake. That's the type of energy that Lottie would be immersed in and she doesn't want that for her. So <laughs> episode ends perfectly. There's so much more I can say, but I'm gonna leave it there. If you have anything to add, you know where to put it. Hit the like if you enjoyed this, subscribe for more. Thanks as always for making it to the end of this one. And until next time, stay safe, stay sane, stay blessed. Love and later.